Virginia is back with you once again, and it finally appears at long last that uh, some of these big city mayors across the nation are finally putting their, their foot down or their feet down uh, when it comes to some of these uh, protesters out there, some of those Occupy Wall Street protesters and Occupy Oakland and Occupy Sheboygan and Occupy Timbuktu and Occupy wherever else that are out there. Uh, we've seen over the past week a lot of these cities have started to kind of clean these people out of some of the parks and the, the public areas that they've been squatting in for, for a couple of months right here in the St. Louis area. We just uh, had some of them cleaned out of Keener Plaza downtown. So uh, I, I don't know what changed the mind of some of these uh, big city mayors, but uh, I don't know if uh, they got sick of dealing with all the crime that was going on down there, or they got sick of funding all the, the, the protection and the security that had to be down there, or hell, maybe they just got sick of the smell. But at long last, these people are being uh, dispersed, and their little movement, and their little, uh, their little ideology is going to go back underground where it belongs. But in looking back on it, I think there's some things that we can uh, take from it. I think there's some things we need to really understand about it. Because even though this movement's going to go back underground and, and, and lose some steam, you are going to hear, as we get closer to the presidential election, you are going to hear some very similar uh, types of speech out of the Democrats and, and out of the, the presidential campaign, I would predict, in terms of what you heard out of the occupiers. Particularly this whole thing about the 99% versus the 1%. One of the things that you heard very quickly out of these protesters, you saw it on their little signs and you heard it in their little sound bites whenever someone would put a camera in front of their face, they would always point out this, you know, 99% of the people have X percentage of the wealth and 1% of the people have some huge number of the wealth. And they would then go so far as to claim that the protesters somehow represented that 99%. In fact, you probably saw on the internet a lot of times you'd have some college kid with a forlorn look on their face and they'd have a piece of notebook paper showing up to Cameron, all these little things telling your sob story and at the very end of it they would say, I am the 99%. And it was a clear attempt to make their outlook, their opinion, their situation appear to be a bigger deal than it was, appear to be much more pervasive than it was. In a way saying, I'm one of the 99% and because A, B, and C happened to me, that accurately represents everybody else. Well, sounds good, but really, it's hogwash when you think about it. When you say 99% of the American people, you say 99% of the American people have a certain percentage of the income or a certain percentage of the wealth, that 99% encompasses a pretty wide range of people. People that believe as you do, people that don't believe as you do, people that are urban areas, rural areas, college educated, high school dropouts, I mean, you couldn't get a more diverse and wide-ranging group of people than you get in that 99%. But yet these college kids and these protesters somehow think that they can accurately represent the voice of that 99%. But it doesn't really make sense, does it? This is sort of a, a common mentality that the left uses whenever they are, are giving you talking points on any number of topics. They always try to take a minority viewpoint or a fringe viewpoint and make it sound as though it represents a much larger group than it really does. Because they use some arbitrary point, some arbitrary point of commonality in a large group of people and take a fringe from that group of people and say because we have that one common thing in common with this big group of people that that means our opinion now represents everybody else. It's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. Let me give you another example of, of, of where you often see this with the left. Think about unions for a second. You cannot hear a union uh, spokesperson or a union leader talk without hearing them say, well, we represent the American worker, and we want what's best for the American worker, and the American workers want, you know, whatever it is that the union's demanding that day. And, you know, you hear this line of thinking out of union leaders, you hear it out of union sympathizing politicians, you hear it out of Democratic talking heads and commentators and so forth. It's a very common thing to hear. When the, the unions never talk about the unions, they always talk about the American worker, right? They always try to make you think that they represent the American worker. But do they really? Well, according to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, back in 2010, the percentage of the American workers that were members of unions were only 11.9%. So, by that simple math, 
union leaders cannot accurately represent the American worker. They can only represent 11.9% of them. The other 88.1% of us likely have nothing in common with what they want. But yet, they put that meme out there that they represent the American worker. They keep repeating that. And after a certain, you know, it sound, sounds good on television, sound good, sounds good in a soundbite. And after a given point, there are going to be a certain percentage of people that just give up and believe it anyway. That's the type of thing that these occupiers are trying to do. Trying to claim that they represent 99% of the American people, when really there's no way that they can. When you take such a large group that has such a superficial thing in common, or such an arbitrary thing in common as the percentage of wealth that they have, there's no way you can accurately represent that large group. Absolutely none at all. But yet they think that because they have one arbitrary thing in common with 99% of America, that somehow they, whatever they say accurately represents the rest of us. Come on. Let's illustrate how absurd that is. Think about Lady Gaga. I know some of you probably don't want to, but Lady Gaga, the singer, the lady that dresses up in meat dresses and does all kinds of weird stuff, among the many things she does is that she can play the piano. They had a couple songs where she does that. By the same token, it's been estimated that 20 million Americans also play the piano. But then does it follow that Lady Gaga's opinion on any number of subjects would represent the other 20 million Americans that play the piano? No, of course not. It's an arbitrary and superficial thing that that group of 20 million people, including Lady Gaga, have in common. Therefore, it's ridiculous to think that she or anybody else could accurately represent their views on wealth redistribution or income or world hunger or any number of other topics. Would, would you say that Lady Gaga has anything at all in common with that nice old lady at your church who plays the piano at service every Sunday morning? No, of course not. Let's give you another example. According to one survey I read, 40 to 50 million people in the world play poker. I'm one of those people. I, I enjoy a good game of poker. But would that make you think that Doyle Brunson or Phil Hellmuth or Jamie Gold or any of those guys could accurately predict for you what I would believe on, on any number of topics? Would, would it follow that Jamie Gold's view on, on uh, international affairs would have anything in common in mind? No, not necessarily. Because what Jamie Gold and I have in common is something very superficial, something very arbitrary. He plays poker, I play poker. He might do it at a different level in some different games, but every Friday night, we're probably at some table somewhere shuffling some cards. But that's all we have in common. I'll give you one final example. I am, I might humbly say, a damn handsome man. Now, because I am a damn handsome man, would you automatically think that I would be able to predict for you or represent what Brad Pitt thinks about anything or what George Clooney thinks about anything? No, of course not. The three of us have something only very superficial and very arbitrary in common. Actually, something rather meaningless in common. Okay, okay, I know. That last example was a bit of a stretch. It, it's certainly a stretch to think that George Clooney could be considered nearly as handsome as me. But I used it as an illustrative point. That point being that when you take some huge group of people and bind them all with something very arbitrary and even something very meaningless, that there's no way that some small subgroup within that set can accurately represent the voice of that set as a whole. So it makes no sense at all to, to see these protesters come out there with their signs saying, I am the 99% and we need to have a revolution in this country, or I am the 99% and we need to take the wealth from everybody else, or, or whatever type of ridiculousness that they're pointing out. And I want you to think about something. If those, those examples I gave you didn't, uh, didn't convince you of this. The 99% of people in America as I said earlier, who do not have that huge amount of wealth, who share a certain percentage of it. That includes a large number of people. That includes me. I'm not one of the wealthiest 1%. I would wager that most of you out there watching the show are not one of the wealthiest 1% either. If you are, hey, I'm glad to meet you, glad you're watching the show, but sheer mathematics would tell you that most of you probably are not in the wealthiest 1%. So we're all in that 99%. But when you think back to the images that we saw during some of these protests and the, the, the rhetoric, the disgusting rhetoric and the anti-American attitudes 
that we heard out of these people during the protests. Think about it. Does that have anything in common with even a significant number of people that you know? I mean, yeah, you might know one or two people that agree with that stuff, but probably the majority of people you meet on an everyday basis really don't want the basic foundations of America torn asunder. They really don't want people stolen from so they can be given a handout. You might know one or two people that way, but I would wager that the majority of people you know probably don't have anything in common with these crazies. And if the majority of people you know do have something in common with those crazies, then, geez, you hang out in some really sick and twisted social circles. I'd look for a different group of friends if I were you. But nevertheless, we see how ridiculous it is for that one small insignificant subgroup to claim that they represent the rest of us in the 99%. Now, it would be ridiculous for anyone to say that they do represent the 99%. I'm certainly not going to do that. But what I can tell you is that I'm one of the 99% by their own definition. But, you know, I'm one of the 99% and I believe that self-responsibility is a much better way to go about life than communal responsibility. I believe that I have a responsibility for whatever I'm going to attain in life and whatever I'm going to accomplish and that others do not have the responsibility to provide that for me. So I believe in self-responsibility, and I am one of the 99%. Also, I do not believe that I should have any sort of hatred or jealousy or enmity or, je or, or any other sort of negative attitude towards those who have achieved more than I have or who have attained more than I have because of their own hard work. I shouldn't be jealous of them at all, I don't think. I don't believe that they owe me anything. And I'm one of the 99%. I also believe that capitalism, while still somewhat imperfect, is nevertheless the best mechanism that human beings have ever discovered to most fairly allocate and distribute resources. And I am the 99%. I believe that the rule of law is paramount to society, and that you know, if you peacefully break the law, you're still breaking the law, and you should be punished for it. I believe that breaking the law peacefully is no more justification for breaking the law than if you did it violently. And I am the 99%. I believe that the traditional values we have as a nation have put us in good stead and have been the foundation for our success as a nation over the years and are the best thing that we can move back towards for our future to get our nation back on the right track, to stay with those traditional institutions and values that have built us up. And I am the 99%. I believe the American family, the two-parent household, is the best way to raise a child. And I am the 99%. You see how easy that is? I can just as easily claim to represent the 99% as those yahoos that are protesting are. Now, I don't... I, I'm not going to actually tell you that because I have those viewpoints, it represents 99% of America. It does not. But I would tell you that I believe it represents, at least some of those things, it represents a much larger percentage of the 99%, a much larger group within that 99% than the occupiers do. So don't fall for the games. Don't fall for how the liberals are positioning this. Just because you are in the 99% doesn't mean you represent them. Let's be clear. What these protesters and these occupiers represent is a dangerous and anti-American subculture within our nation. And it's the same dangerous anti-American subculture that has existed on our college campi for 40 or 50 years. They're the same people that back when I was in college 15 years ago, you'd see them out on, we had a place called Speaker Circle at the University of Missouri where I went to school at. And any, any yay who could come up there and demonstrate or protest anything they wanted to, well, they, these people were the type of people that you'd walk by a speaker circle and you'd see them bashing a television with a sledgehammer. Or you'd see them with signs saying, Free Tibet. You know, all those Free Tibet signs I saw in college, and no one ever handed me a Free Tibet. I, I don't know where I'm supposed to get my Free Tibet at. I, some of them must have been handing them out because I saw the signs everywhere. But nevertheless, the people that I saw back then who are protesting any and everything. They're the same type of people that you're seeing in Occupy Wall Street today. That same subculture 
who for some reason, unbeknownst to me and probably unbeknownst to them, have an axe to grind with America. That's all it is. They're just getting some more camera time these days. They don't represent the 99% any more than anybody else does. Just because they're in the 99%, it doesn't mean they're one of us, because they certainly are not. Come election day in 2012, we'll really see who represents the 99%. I think that we are at least a better representation of it than they are. This is America's Evil Genius. See you next week.